Ken Gobb's supposed to be with us on December the 8th. I may tell him just to stay home. It's actually his birthday. Yeah, I, I don't know why the guy's out traveling and preaching on his birthday. He needs to be with his family and celebrate. So anyway, tentatively that's happening. I may just tell him, hey, we're going to send you an offering. Be blessed and be with your wife and enjoy your day off. It's like, you know, he's been doing, he's 82, he'll be 83. So still going strong. You'd never know he's that old, would you? No way. The guy's just phenomenal. So anyway, let's go ahead. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 15. This will be the beginning of our tape roll, Jeff, for editing purposes. How to Receive and Walk in God's Blessing has been the series that we've been in now for a number of uh, weeks that I've been here. And today's teaching is actually entitled The Facts of Giving. And I, I added a, another word on there. It's not on the screen, but I added it to my notes. And that is the facts of giving offerings. Because as we're teaching, we're really specifically talking about offerings per se. Um, by way of introduction, uh, it says the Christian gift of giving ought to be exercised as an act of worship with preparation, purpose, and joy. How many of you agree with that? That our giving ought to be an act of worship first and foremost, because whatever we do in thought, word, or deed, we do it all as unto the Lord. That's worship. How I many of you know your job's worship? Yes. Yeah. So as an act of worship, we do that. And our giving is, preparation is involved in that fact in terms of how to give, what to give, and its purpose, the direction, what it's intended for, and then actually we do it with joy. I don't know about you, but I, I get excited about giving. There ought to be something about giving and the excitement of it. In the book of 2 Samuel, you don't need to go there. It's found in the book of 2 Samuel 24, 18 through 25, is a story. And the story is really the result of judgment that came on the nation of Israel. As David was the king, what ended up happening is, is he counted or he numbered the fighting men. And the reason that God penalized him was of the fact that God says, I'm your source, I'm your strength, I'm your ability. Why did you do that? So then he sent word, I'm going to give you three judgments, three years of plague, pestilence or whatever, um, three months of something else, and then finally three days of plague. He says, I leave it in the Lord's hands, he'll do what's right. So it was three days of plague. From, from the, from all of, throughout all of Israel, 70,000 people died in that duration. It says that the angel of the Lord went and killed 70,000 people as a result of that one act that the king did. David cried out and he says, I the shepherd and the guilty one. Don't take any more lives on my behalf. What do you require of us? So Gad came and he spoke on behalf of the Lord. And he says that he needed to offer an altar, a sacrifice to God. And so David goes up to a guy by the name of Aranu. He was a Jebusite. He wasn't even necessarily a Jewish person. But he owned a piece of property. And it was there that this angel of the Lord was at that could be visibly seen. It says, and David saw the angel of the Lord. And so he says he cried out and he said to Aranu, the Jebusite, hey, listen, sell me your property Sell me your oxen, sell me the wood, and I'm going to make a sacrifice to the Lord to stop this plague. Aranu, being the nice guy that he is, says, hey, listen, you can take the oxen, you can take the, all the equipment that goes with them, the yoke, everything along with it, and you can take the land. It's yours. I'll give it to you to sacrifice. Now watch David's famous words. His words were this, I will not offer to the Lord any offering that does not cost me something. Amen. Offering always costs you something. Offering is over and above the tithe. You know, we teach the tithe here. The tithe is one-tenth part of a whole. It's the foundation of giving. It's the base structure. My personal opinion is that you've not given until you've given the tithe. None of us would think about going into a restaurant and leaving a measly 10% tip. The minimum tip today is 20%. It's not even 10%. So when I get ready to give and my meal comes and because I'm such a good mathematician, I bring out my phone. <laughs> so then I'll take my phone and I'll go to my calculator page and I'll look at the tip and I'll always round it up to the higher amount, not the lesser amount. And so let's say it's, let's say it's just like for purposes sake, $58. 
$58. Okay, so I have $58. So what do I do that is I times that times 0 0.20 equals $11.60. So in actuality, I'll round it up to 12 bucks, and that's what I'll leave my server. Why is that? Because I believe in blessing those that have served me. Even there are times that service has not been so good, I still tip. I still tip. So why would we think any less of giving God 10% when we will tip 20%? Uh -huh. Amen. That's good. So that's foundational. Above and beyond that is our giving that is both in offerings and in alms. People struggle with this alms thing. Somebody, I think it was Joe, read last week out of the book of Matthew where it talks about don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. You remember that whole yeah. passage where Jesus says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Yeah. What he's talking about is he's talking about alms. Because when you read it in context, it says that the Pharisees in their rich garments and their overflowing robes, they go out and they stand in the street corner and they have criers, look, look, we're giving money, we're giving money, look at us, we're giving money to the poor. That's almsgiving. That's what he's talking about. Your deeds before the poor, those that don't have a lot of money. I know that's embarrassing to give people money that way. Now, for some people, it's not. They stand out with a street sign and say, hey, I need money for this, that, and everything else. And I've seen every imaginable thing. And there's the honest ones that says, I need money for a beer. That's an honest one there. Or give me money for a cheeseburger or whatever. A couple of weeks ago on a Wednesday night, Helen and I were leaving Wednesday night service. And I got, I got all of a sudden, we had really crunch time before service. And so I didn't get an opportunity to eat very much. So I just started to stop in to DQ. And I wanted a, like an ice cream. And I like chocolate ice cream. Soft serve is my favorite. You can have your hard ice cream. It's okay in its place. But I love soft serve ice cream. So I wanted a medium chocolate ice cream cone. And then she goes, you want it dipped? I says, yeah, I'll take a dip. Why not? If you're offering, I want it dipped too. And I says, and by the way, give me a chili dog as well. Helen, she's simple. She just wanted a box of dilly bars of the mint persuasion, okay? So that was easy. They went back. They had that. My ice cream cone, they made it quick, dipped it in. But the chili dog, for whatever reason, was taking forever. And so it kept going on, and I'm looking back there and go, man, how long does it take to make a chili dog? I'm thinking I'm becoming a little bit irritated. None of you ever have those experiences while waiting for food, right? And so finally, finally, the, the lady yells back, and she says, hey, he didn't order a corn dog. He ordered a chili dog. How's it coming? And, you know, there's a kid back there, probably 17, that's, you know, cooking. And so you know how that goes sometimes, not disparaging all 17-year-olds. But anyway... This guy was making my chili dog. Finally, he got it all together, nuked it in the microwave and everything else. And finally, it came after me. You know, the dilly bars were already gotten. And my ice cream cone literally was totally almost eaten except for the final part of the cone, my medium. And so finally, I get my chili dog. I walk out. And when I walk out, here's a guy who comes up to me, a homeless guy. He says, hey, you got money for me to have. Can you buy me a cheeseburger? He says, you got money. He says, can you buy me a cheeseburger? Now, I'll go for that. I ain't handing people money because you never know what they're going to do with the money. I will buy them a meal if they're legitimately hungry and want a meal. So you know what I did? I had my chili dog in hand. I just said, here, here you go. I handed it to him. So I don't know. Did the Lord set me up to give this guy a chili dog? I don't know. I don't know. But all I know is that was an alms. That's an example of an alm. I didn't give him money, but I gave him something tangible that was meeting a practical need. He was hungry. He wanted something warm in his belly. It was a cold night. He had a hot steam and chili dog with cheese and onions on top. There you go. I got in the car. Helen said, what took you so long? I said, don't ask. Here's your dilly bars. Let's go. Of course, I couldn't leave it alone. I did have to tell this story on the rest of the way home. Yeah. But that's an alm. That's different. How many of you know we can all give alms? Do you know when you give clothes away to goodwill, you're giving alms? It's to the poor. It's to those in need. That's what it says when it says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Because it doesn't go through the church. Nobody looks at it. Nobody writes and says, all right, you're getting a receipt at the end of the year, and this is going to be for this amount what you gave away. No, it's only you and God know what you gave. It's between you and the Lord. That's almsgiving offerings are given and they're accounted for 
Because they're giving specifically to a tangible thing. Usually at the end of the year, we say, hey, we have a project at Word and Spirit. We'd like you to consider giving a year-end gift towards above and beyond your regular giving. You know what? People do it all the time. We're giving an offering to Dove Medical by taking those little bottles that are going away. That's an offering. That's a very practical thing that we're doing. So I have no misgivings in asking people to give towards projects. Again, coming back to the fact as we end this whole thing on how to receive and walk in God's blessing, the tithe, foundational. That goes to the house of the Lord. If this is where you're planted, if this is where you're receiving spiritual food, this is your house. It's where your tithe goes to meet the needs of this church body. I ain't, I ain't going to have a chicken dinner or spaghetti dinner to raise money to fund the church. I just believe that's not how we run the church. I believe the church is run off the tithes and offerings of the people that attend it. We believe first and foremost the, self, the church is self-propagating. That means we win the lost. It's self-governing. That means that the government comes from within the house, appointed by the lead pastor. The trustees and the, the, the leaders, the elders, the deacons, and the leadership comes from within. That's self-governing. And it is also self-funding. That means we don't get money from other resources. We don't have some rich organization that funds our cause. Now, that'd be nice. I wouldn't mind that. Did you see this past week? The new billionaire in the world, the richest man in the world is Bill Gates. He passed Jeff Bezos again. I don't know if that's because Bezos got divorced and had to give a bunch of his billions away to his ex-wife, or his, I think Bill Gates' stock went up, and so he passed him up again. So there's always this Bezos. I think he's worth $110 billion. That's with the B dollars. That's a lot of money, folks. Can you imagine what the church could do with $110 billion? The richest men in the, in the world are right here in the United States of America. So it's Gates and Bezos and Warren Buffett and others that are here. So as we get into this whole thing of giving, we're talking about tithe, foundational. Offerings is what we've been teaching on the last few weeks together. It's over and above. And so I want to talk about the facts of giving offerings. David said, I will not give to the Lord anything that does not personally cost me something. So you're giving away your money in an offering. It may mean you gave up a cheeseburger. It may mean you gave up a Coke. It may mean you gave up a pizza. Mm -hmm. Whatever it is, that you foregoed that to give it to something else that was more tangible and God directed. All right? Now, God's not opposed to you having a cheeseburger once in a while or a pizza once in a while. Our custom, our tradition, I mean, some traditions are all right. Our tradition is, is whenever we have a game, a duck game, we get a pizza, Papa Murphy's pizza, and then we get kind of what everybody likes on that. I get a family size. If I need to get two pizzas, I'll do that. If it, but, but we'll get something that everybody has, the kind of pizza they like. And then we chow it down to there's nothing left, like last night. It's a tradition. Okay? So that's the deal. So as we teach this, this, this morning specifically, I want to talk about four ways about the facts of giving. The first is the amount. Everybody say the amount. Yeah. Take a look, if you would, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning at verse number 6. Paul writes, he says, remember this. In other words, put it in your, remembering, your memory bank. Don't forget it. Remember means don't forget, right? Yeah. Look at somebody say, don't forget. Yeah. So he says, remember this. It is a principle. In fact, this is a law. Anybody ever heard the law of gravity? Yeah. What is the law of gravity? What happens? Isaac Newton, apple falls, it's going to what? Go down. It's not going to go up, it's going down. It's the law of gravity. It's a law. You can't change it. Something's dropped, it's going to fall. Anybody ever heard the law of second law of thermodynamics? Anybody know what that law is? It's a true law. Everything doesn't get better, it gets worse. Okay, it degenerates. Lock up a house. Put everything away. And I'll tell you what, come back a year later and you'll have dust everywhere. Things begin to deteriorate. They begin to deteriorate. That's the second law of thermodynamics. There's another law. It is called the law of reciprocity. It's found in Genesis 8, 22. It's a law put in motion by God himself. 
And he says it through the writer of the book of Genesis, who happens to be the prophet Moses. You know what Moses says? He says this, under the inspiration and writing of the, under the Holy Spirit, as long as the earth endures, is the earth still enduring? That means it's still here. There will be seed time and harvest. You plant a seed, you reap a harvest. It's a law. Everybody say a law. Just like there's the law of gravity, just like there's the law of second law of thermodynamics, just like there is this also this law of reciprocity. You plant a seed, you get a harvest. And you know what the law is? Is it always comes back more than is planted. Always comes back more. Never less, but more. Okay? You plant a seed, there's a harvest that is coming. Now, we don't know how long that harvest takes because everything has a season. Everybody say season. When you planted tomatoes this past year and you went out spring, whenever it was, and you says, all right, it's good enough to get the tomatoes in the ground. And you do what you do. And pretty soon they start coming up. Pretty soon the plants come up. And then pretty soon the little, the little things, the blossoms on the end. And pretty soon that, that, that tomato takes form. And, and pretty soon it's green. And then it's green and green and green. And I don't like fried green tomatoes. I want a ripe, juicy red tomato. That's the way I like my tomatoes. Off the vine is even better. Talking about pizza a moment ago, you slice up a ripe tomato and you throw that on top of a pizza. Woo, baby, there's nothing like that. In the old days, I would have salt and peppered it up. Now I just put hot chili peppers and then I put cayenne pepper and then black pepper, no salt. But that's good. Try that sometime if you want a good piece of pizza. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, I know it's good when my heat starts rising out of my head and there's a little heat up here coming off the top of my, my little spot that's thin up here. Then it's really good. Yeah, that's exactly right. Amount. Everybody say amount. Point number one is the amount. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. That is a law. It's called the law of seed time and harvest. It is the law of reciprocity. It is a genuine law that is just like other laws. The amount. So it's the law of the harvest. It's referred to repeatedly in Scripture. Go with me to the book of Proverbs. Don't lose your place here. But let's go back to the book of Proverbs. We see it in Proverbs 11, 24, and 25. Proverbs 19, 17. Then we'll look at it in the New Testament as well. But let's go to the book of Proverbs chapter 11. Here's what it says, Proverbs 11, 24, and 25. These are the pithy statements of Solomon as he writes, the wisest man in the world. How many of you know you can be wise and still be stupid? Yes. Not take your own advice. Yeah. Don't follow your own advice. Okay? And so I've seen people with doctorates that just are not smart about common sense things. I mean, they have earned doctorates, brilliant minds, but just really unwise about stuff in general. Okay, here we go. Proverbs eleven twenty four. One person gives what, everybody? Freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. Why is that? Because they've not understood the principle seed time and harvest. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be what? Refreshed. If you are broke, busted, and disgusted, you don't have to stay there. The good news is this, is that as you begin to operate in the principles of the kingdom, you can change your situation. It's called a paradigm shift. It means you change your way of thinking, your way of acting that changes your bottom financial line. Now, it may be progressive, but you can change your present financial situation by operating in the principles of the kingdom. If you agree with that, say amen. amen. See, because if you've been raised in an environment that is a poverty mindset, and by the way, it is a real mindset, and there are real families that perpetually have a poverty mindset that in, ends up perpetuating poverty living. It's generational. That has to be broken by understanding the truth of God's Word. And when the truth of God's Word is that God doesn't want you broke, busted, and disgusted, that He wants you to be blessed, that you might in turn be a blessing, as seen clear back in Genesis 12, when God spoke to Abraham, He says, leave your people, go to the place that I will show you, come out of the earth, Chaldees, and what ends up happening, I will show you to the place that you will go to. And what ends up happening, He says, you are going to be a blessed generation, 
your nation, your people group will be blessed. That will begin a, a blessing to all nations. How do you know that ultimately came through Jesus Christ? And as we saw a number of weeks ago in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse number 9, he became poor that we might become rich spiritually, emotionally, mentally, physically, and financially in every arena. Amen. And by the way, rich is relative. Okay, rich is relative. You may not be a billionaire, but rich means having your needs met that you can also then help others. That's rich as far as I'm concerned. Okay, and that can be progressive and can become exponential. I can tell you right now, Helen and I are, are blessed financially in comparison to when we were first married. When we were first married, we were both in college, paying our way through school. And what ended up happening is our outgo was better, bigger than our income. How do you know that is you're in reverse? You're going the wrong direction. you got to change that. So being the man of the house and the head of the house, because the Bible says that I am, and she being the woman, she came to me and says, Honey, you're going to have to do something about this. How do you like that? You're going to have to do something about this. We're going in the hole. We have to change this. Either you're going to have to spend less, or we're going to have to have more coming in in order to pay our bills. So we got creative and we ended up doing that. You know what we did is I went looking for other jobs. Now, it wasn't that I had enough. I was going to school full time and I had a job doing concrete. I had a job delivering bundle papers to the kiddies that then delivered the paper. And then I also got another job. And that job was I went to work for a mortuary that paid for our housing, paid for our phone local. And also I got an income besides that. Have you know, it reversed our situation. So at the end of four years period of time, when we both graduated from college, we owed no man anything except the debt to love them. We were we're totally out of debt. Now, I wish I was still in that position. I'm not. But we were. So I want you to know God can bless you in your current situation if you'll operate in the principles of the kingdom. So the amount was this. He gave freely and gained even more. That person, a generous person, will prosper. How many of you know that's in the Bible? Is that in your Bible? Yep. Prosper. So when people say, oh, I don't think you should prosper. Well, then you're arguing against God's word. I said, you're arguing against God's Word. That's right. God's Word says He does desire for you to prosper. Yeah, and again, right. prosperity is determinative upon what you believe and where you live, and that can grow. Amen. That's good. Write down Luke 6.38. You guys all know it. Contextually, it's talking about specifically uh, judging. With the measure that you use, you're going to be judged. All right? We already know that. But then Luke 6.38 says, give... And it shall be given unto you. How? Pressed down, shaken together, running over with the measure that you use, it'll be measured back to you. Amount, little amount, little comes back. Bigger amount, more comes back. So he's talking about the amount now, and Paul is applying this specifically to giving as I'm now quoting these various scriptures. Another one, Galatians 6, 7. Now this is spiritual, but it has application to all arenas. Be not deceived. In other words, don't delude yourself. God is not mocked whatsoever a man. We're talking about mankind for all of you that has to deal with this gender issue stuff. Mankind, whatsoever man sows, man or woman, whatever you sow, that shall they also, what everybody? Reap. Reap. Now, how many more scriptures do I need to quote? See, the Bible says, let everything be established by the mouth of two or three witnesses. Seed, time, and harvest is a principle. You get to determine the amount of an offering, little or a lot. The choice right. is up to you. That's right. Some things I think you should pray about. Some things I think if you're a husband and wife, you should get an agreement on. That's right. Okay? And some stuff you should just give. There have been times my wife will say to me, Honey, I, I, I gave this amount away on our behalf. Well, what am I going to say? Good. Go for it. I'm glad. We're in agreement. I, there are times that I've said, Hey, I gave this away. We're, we're in agreement. We're one. And so my point is simply this, is that there are different ways to give. It needs to be premeditated. Sometimes that premeditation can come in the moment, in the spur of the moment. Sometimes you may need to pray about that. I think sometimes people's prayer is just simply a cop-out for doing nothing. 
That's in a lot of arenas. Oh, let me pray about that. <coughs> no, you just don't want to do it. Let's just get honest. All right. Look at somebody say he's talking about somebody other than you right now. Giving is like sowing seed. The amount of the harvest is determined by the amount of the seed sown. So that's point number one as we deal with the facts of giving, specifically offerings. <coughs> number two is attitude. Number two is attitude. Look at verse number seven. Go back, if you would, please, now to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number seven. <coughs> Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a what kind of giver? Cheerful, Cheerful giver. Yeah. It's exactly right, Debbie. The word is hilarion. hilarion. It comes from hilarion, the Greek word hilarion, which means hilarious in our English language. It's most accurately translated, cheerful. <coughs> you're excited about it. You're happy about it. You're pleased to do it. I mean, why would you give away anything that you just are unwilling to part with? It ought to be a, a desire. So knowing the law of the harvest, as we saw just a moment ago in verse 6, each believer should give as he or she purposes in their heart. The believer is to give freely and cheerfully, not out of compulsion, and especially without regret. Oh, I'm so sorry I gave that away. Oh, I wish I would have never given that away. <laughs> now, what I said a moment ago applies even here. You can give money. You can give cars. You can give clothes. You can give food. There's all kinds of things that you can give. Yeah, time is even a gift. Your time in contributing to something. Maybe you don't have any actual dollars, cash. You can come and give of your time and volunteer it. The attitude is the key thing here. Okay, do you do it willingly or do you do it begrudgingly? Do you do it because you are excited about doing it or do you do it dragging your heels? The Bible says in Proverbs 23, 7, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he or she. Okay. Now, contextually, that's talking about sitting down with a king. And it says, if you're given to gluttony, put a knife to your throat. That's hyperbole. You don't actually do that. I mean, a gluttony is overeating. Then he goes on to say, the king will sit and watch and you'll think, what in the world, what in the world am I doing? Why am I giving all this food away? Because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. That's what he's really thinking in his heart when he's giving it away. It's not genuine. See, that's the important thing. I really believe this. I believe that when we stand before the Lord at the Bema Seat Judgment, as seen in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and it talks about in verse 10 giving an account for deeds done well in the body. It's talking about the Bema Seat judgment. In other words, why we did what we did, not what we did as much as why we did what we did. Did you hear me? Why we did what we did, the motive of the heart. Amen. That's right. That's good. Motives are going to be judged. That's right. Did I do it to be seen? That's all the Pharisees did. What did Jesus say to them? Hey, they've gotten their reward. They stood, they blew their trumpets, they said, hey, come look at me, look at all I'm shelling out and all I'm giving away, I'm awesome, look at how philanthropic I am to give to this organization or that organization. I'm always amazed when I read in the obituary of people that said, this person was a philanthropic person and many did not know that they gave to this organization or they gave to this organization. That's awesome. Amen. Because they're recognized after the fact, after their passing, of what their kind deeds were, that it was genuine, it was truly of the heart. And so attitude is absolutely important. You know what? When you sit in a service, and I've been in many services in my lifetime growing up in the church, I've watched every kind of an imaginable offering taken. <laughs> Brow beating off. I mean, I've been in churches where, you know, they've counted money, it wasn't enough, so they passed the bucket again. Literally, there are some churches where you got four or five offerings. Wow. Got to have an offering for this, an offering for that, an offering for this, an offering for that. And, get, and they'll count it. Oh, it wasn't good enough. Let's pass the bucket again. I've been in services where they've done the challenge thing, and, and it's okay. Somebody will stand up and say, I'm going to give $100. And then somebody else say, ah, this usually happens in conferences. I've seen this in conferences. They have a project. Well, I'm going to give 100 bucks. Well, I'll give 100 bucks. And somebody else, there's somebody else. It's like an auction. Hey, TV, seven, 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 se
Uh, 2020, you know, it's like, it's like they're bidding. I've given on behalf of the church before as the senior leader. I've been to meetings where a missionary need came up, and this is, can we, we got to raise X amount of dollars, and, and, and we didn't go run around with all kinds of fanfare. We just says, uh, uh, you know, we put in there and says, a promissory note of it, we will be good for X amount of dollars. It's the attitude. Right. It's the heart. That's right. That when you give it, it's joyful, it's exciting, that you just love giving it away. I mean, you can buy somebody a meal. I've been sitting, Helen and I have been sitting at, at lunch before, dinner before, and all of a sudden we get ready to pay and we're waiting for a bill and they says, hey, so somebody wanted to take care of you and that somebody saw us there for whatever reason, knew us somehow, and they just paid for our meal. You say, well, why'd that happen? Because we did it too. Because we've done it before as well. We've bought many, many meals for people. So anyway, it's this whole attitude. It's a mindset. It's why? Because it's the mindset of your heavenly Father. Did you know God's a giving God? Amen. He's a giving God. Yeah. So if that's the Father's heart, that becomes our heart because we're one. Didn't Jesus say, I and the Father are one? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And we've come and we've made our abode in you. So he lives on the inside of us. So if I have the same attitude as my father, then it makes me want to be a giver. Mm -hmm. Attitude is number two. Number three is the abundance that is a byproduct. So first is the amount. The second is the attitude. The third thing is the abundance. Take a look at verses eight through seven. And God is able to bless you abundantly. Sounds like another passage of Scripture that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or imagine according to His power that's at work within us. Anybody ever heard that Scripture? Yeah. Sounds a lot like this. How many of you believe that? God is able to do what? To bless you how? Little bit? Not much? Abundantly. Now, in the book of John 10.10, 10, it says the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Now it's talking, it's inferring the enemy, although it's not specifically talking about Satan. And Jesus says, I've come to give you life. And this is true, whether that's talking about Satan or not. He says, but I've come to give you life and that life how? More abundantly. The Greek word is hupomeno, H-U-P-O-M-E-N-O, hupomeno. Hupomeno in the Greek means this. It means super abundant. So Jesus is saying, and is there any redeemed in the house today? I've come to give you life. The word life is zoe, Z-O-E, zoe. It means the God quality of life. I have come to give you the God quality of life, and that life barely get by. That life broke, busted, and disgusted. No, that life and that life, how more, using the adjective, abundantly, hupomeno, more abundantly. That is what God has come to do for us in Christ Jesus. So when you begin to wrap your mind and your head around the fact that this is God's desire for you, that not only is it His desire, but that desire has to be actualized, that on our part, the part that we play, say the part that I play, look at your neighbor say the part that you play, is first of all, believing that. If you don't believe that, guess what? How are you ever going to receive it? Yeah, that's right. I say this. The watermark for the faith level for anything is predicated upon the teaching and the preaching that goes forth from any house. Why is that? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. If you never teach and preach about miracles, guess what? You ain't getting any, baby. If you never teach and preach on healing, you're not going to have many healings manifested. What you preach and teach is what you get. Why? Because the faith level is elevated to a higher mark that you can believe God for this because now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. Faith is always in the now. Hope is always in the future. So now faith is. Faith for what? Whatever you have need of. That your faith level rises. Why? Because you've heard it preached. You've heard it taught. You've spoken it out of your mouth. That this is God's will concerning you. 
Now, you have a part to play. First is this. Number one, believing that. Number two, acting on that. What have you done to engender God to bring blessing into your life? Remember what I said, the law of seed, time, and harvest. If you've never planted any seed, how in the world are you going to get any harvest? That's why people come up all the time. We're going to have a prayer to break off debt and break off this and break off that, and we're going to release you into abundance. Well, if you haven't given, I can rub my hand on your head to your bald, and if you never give, guess what? You ain't getting nothing because you aren't operating in the principles of the kingdom. See, when we started this a long, long time ago, we were young pups, newly married. It either works then, and you can't wait till you're in your 30s, and I'll wait and I'll catch up. No, that isn't how it works. You start where you're at. Everybody say, start where I'm at. Start where I'm at. Wherever you are, that's where you begin this journey of giving to break the cycle of debt and poverty and begin to bring the blessing and the prosperity of God into your life. Going on, he says, verse 8 and following. God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, 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 having some of what you need. No, everybody say have all. You will abound in every good work. That means you can turn around and abound. And posting your need on Facebook ain't going to solve the problem. Sometimes I think people just want to whine. And you know what? I don't want to be around whining. It just drags me down. I want to hear what God can do through you. It does. It chokes out the flow. Oh, this happened. Oh, that happened. Oh, this happened. Oh, that happened. I mean, we, how many of you all have stories that cost you money? You know what our most recent one is? I'm just telling you out of humor's sake, not so much whining because I hate that. But, but this is more out of humor's sake. All of a sudden at our house, something stunk to high heavens. And we had, we, you know, it, was gotten, it got cold, and all of a sudden we saw a mice scurrying, and my dog went chasing after it. And I go, oh, there's, those mice are getting scared in the house. It's too cold. <coughs> so immediately we got, we got the traps up. We get the sticky feet one, you know, where they get caught in it, and they squeal, and then you got to, you know, take care of them. That's the bad part. But anyway, we, I put out these traps, and, and the next thing I know, I heard a noise, go, something in the kitchen. And I went in there, and here's Allie Dog. She had this mouse tipped over, got caught in the trap. I mean, it was like the same night, trapped over, and she'd already killed it. <laughs> Good for her. So then she went screaming into the other bedroom where Helen has our spare bedroom, has her computer and everything all set up in there. Zoom! She chased the mouse out of there, and it went down the hallway and took a left, and it went into our dryer, washer-dryer region, Right? And it went into there, and we never saw it. And then all of a sudden, we started smelling this horrible smell. <laughs> and we put these traps out everywhere. No more mice. We must have killed the only two in the house or something. But the one never came out. We couldn't figure out what happened to it. <laughs> stink, 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 like stink, dead stink. And I'm, I mean, it's nasty. We're lighting candles every room in the house. We went to Walmart, got every candle of the same smell you could get. Big ones, small ones, everyone, they're all the same flavor. And we got them lit in every room, and you can still smell it. It was horrible. Days, we went on a rampage, searching everything. We knew we'd kill all the mouse. I went to all the vents, vacuumed them all up, everything, every, you know, the floor vents, pulled them all up. Nothing. Couldn't find anything. And so, finally, every time Helen ran the dryer, that's when the stink emerged. She finally called out the technician. He came out, and he tore our dryer all apart, and... And he was saying to Helen, he says, yeah, it's a, it's a good thing that I'm a, I'm a very clean nut and that I hate mice or whatever, but I found a nest in your heater area, and when I grabbed a hold of it with my glove, I just reversed my glove, but there was something soft and mushy on the inside of that nest. I'm pretty sure that's where that mouse went to, and he died in his nest. And every time she hit the heat, stink Ola, man. I mean stink. Praise God, we've been delivered from the stench. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, praise God. 
we went a step further. We had the vent guy come out, and he's sucked all our vents out and cleaned them out and everything else, and, and we're good to go. It's sterling in there now. It's awesome. <laughs> but stuff like that just happens. It's part of life. What am I going to whine about? I feel sorry for me. I just spill emotion in my house. <laughs> I'm only telling you because it's worth a laugh, you know? It wasn't laughable when I was there in the midst of it, but... God desires for you to have abundance. Amen. Verse 9, as it is written, we're at, we're going to find out in a minute, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. That's Psalms, their righteousness endures forever. That's Psalms 112.9. If you look at your footnote in the margin there, it's a quote from Psalms 112, verse 9. Now he, he quotes another passage of Scripture. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your <laughs> righteousness. <clears throat> How do you know God gets seed to you? That's money. Yeah. Amen. And bread for food. One you eat, the other you do what? Give. You plant. You eat the bread, you plant the seed. 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 You don't eat all of your seed. Amen. That's right. You plant some. He says, food will also supply the increase of your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You'll be made rich or enriched in every way so that you can be, some of your versions will have be made rich. Enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. Through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. The reason for abundance is so that you can turn around and be a channel of blessing and abundance. If you don't have anything, you can't give anything. That's why I'm against the church being dirt poor. Because when the church is dirt poor, she doesn't have anything to give or help anybody with. And by the way, the church historically has been on the leading edge of major movements that have helped indigent people, that have helped people that have been in need, and, and homeless children and orphanages and widows and things of that nature. That's the church that led the way in those things. And so there's this whole thing of abundance. Go with me to Isaiah 55, because that's the thing that he's alluding to. Isaiah 55, it's really a passage prophetically about the restoration of the nation of Israel, what will happen one day again. But it also is quoted here by the Apostle Paul as he writes to the church at Corinth regarding their giving. Isaiah 55, many of you know it, it's a pretty famous passage of Scripture, but I want you to start at verse number 8. And we're going to read down through verse number 11. You ready? Yep. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither my ways your ways. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. How do you know that to be true? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Verse 9. As the heavens, plural, and that's singular, that means there's more than one, are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. How do you know that to be true also? Yeah. Verse 10. As rain and snow come down from heaven, singular, and do not return to it without watering the earth and making... Didn't you learn this when you were a kid in school? Clouds, the whole cycle. And making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower. And there it is. And bread for the eater. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty or void, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. So he takes an excerpt from that passage and he utilizes it to illustrate his point that just as this whole thing happens, sometimes we don't even know how. The water comes down from heaven, it waters it, it increases all this thing, and then it goes back again. And the cycle and the process, God will take care of it. Will not God also take care of you and get you the abundance that you need to do what needs to be done? But that means that you're doing your part to release God to do His part. Faith is always involved. That means you take a step of action. See, I could take an offering after this teaching. I could whip you all up into a lather and I could say, all right, now we're going to take an offering. You'd be on a high charge. Yeah, let's do this thing. But guess what? We already took the offering. And I ain't taking an offering. So there's this abundance. In generosity, Paul wants the Corinthians to understand that their abundance exists for the sake of generosity and thanksgiving to God and generosity to others. Let's go on, <coughs> excuse me, number four, <coughs> and that is appreciation. 
Point number one, as you're taking notes regarding the facts of giving, is the amount. Number two is our attitude. Number three is abundance. Number four is appreciation. What does all this result in? It results in appreciation. How do you know we all like to be appreciated? Everybody does. Go, if you would, please, back to... And by the way, appreciation is saying thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I mean, parents teach it to their kids all the time. When somebody gives you something, say what? Thank, thank you. you. It's appreciation. <clears throat> So he says here, take a look now, verse 12 through verse 15. This service that you perform is not only of supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also, that's specifically the people in Jerusalem, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ. That means that they can see your confession is true. Why? Because you're doing something that evidences that you are born again by your confession. And of your generosity and sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. So when the gift from the Corinthians was put to work in Jerusalem, remember Titus and these guys were taking it there to Jerusalem. What happens, it would supply the needs of the saints there who were in need. But it would also result in many people giving thanks to who? God for utilizing the Corinthians along with the Macedonians and those from Achaia giving to meet the need. The they refers to the Jerusalem Christians in verse 13. Verse 14, Paul anticipated that God's grace would lead the Jerusalem Christians to pray for the Corinthian believers and be deeply concerned about them and give thanks to God for their gift. <clears throat> Go with me to the book of Philippians, if you would. Start wrapping this up. Philippians chapter 4. See, Paul understood receiving offerings to him and his ministry to carry on and do what he needed to get done. Philippians 4, verse 10. Here's what it says. I rejoice greatly in the Lord. Hey, there it is. I rejoiced. Greatly in the Lord that you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need. For I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. He says, whatever it is, I'm going to be okay with it. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. How many of you know I'll take the plenty over the in need? How many of you have ever been in need? Let me see your hands. Yeah, of course. I'll take the, I'll take the, 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 the plenty over that. <clears throat> he says, I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. That's in context. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Verse 14, yet it was good for you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of, here it is again, giving and what, everybody? Receiving. There's that law. Except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. We know what that is. Helen and I in our ministry, in the early days of our ministry, when we never knew if you're getting a paycheck from week to week to week to week or whatever, and know that there was consistency. People outside who loved you and cared about you sent you an offering every month because they believed in what you were doing. Amen. For even when I was within Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts, plural, what I desire is that more may be credited to your account. Do you get that? More may be in credit to your account. By who? By me? No, by God. Amen. That's right. I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied. I like that. Have more than enough. I don't know about you, but I want to have more than enough. Yeah. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts, plural, you have sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice pleasing to God. They would have understood that simply because they had incense offerings that were an offering of worship and that it went up to God, that it was a sweet-smelling savor as unto the Lord. Amen. And my God will meet all of your needs. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody yeah. say all. 
all of your needs. How? According to the riches of His glory in Christ Jesus. It's through Christ that He will meet your need. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Did the early church need money to run? Did the early church need money to evangelize? Did Paul say, hey, listen, thank you for your gifts? That meant he also challenged them to give. As he's doing the Corinthians to give to the Jerusalem saints. It's no different. It's still the same today. Ministry takes money. (coughs) And as a result of that, it takes the money of the people to support that ministry. So as we begin to close today, talking about these facts of giving, we talked about the amount, we talked about the right attitude, we talked about abundance, we talked about appreciation or giving thanks to God. Now look at verse 15, I close with this. Out of 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 15. Thanks be to God for His indescribable gift. Do you think Paul ever had a lack for explaining something? No. Everybody say no. The guy was a scholar. The guy was a Hebrew of Hebrews. The guy was a Pharisee of Pharisees. The guy was learned. He had an earned doctorate degree in today's nomenclature, in today's terminology. He would have had multiple doctorates. Brilliant mind. Sat at the feet of Gamaliel, the leading theologian of his day. That's who he learned from. And yet he comes to this point and he says, all right, at the end of all this, I'm out of words. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift indescribable, uncontainable. And remember this song? Da, 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 da. It reminds me of that. You run out of words to describe the goodness of God. She so says, it's indescribable. That's how powerful God is. And it refers to Jesus Christ who brought about salvation through His, de- his life, death, and resurrection. It also refers to God's generosity through Jesus Christ. He became poor so that those who believe in Him might become rich, what? In every way. (coughs) Now, don't get me confused when I talk about rich. I'm not talking about billionaire rich, although I'll pray that we have some of those. Or millionaires. But rich is simply having your needs met and with enough left over to bless others. And then believing that to increase exponentially. Amen. <clears throat> yeah. Good words, John. Yeah, good Let's stand, shall we?